Okay, I'm back at the beginning. Um, so I'm going to be looking over here a lot because that's where I'm seeing my presentation. Um, thanks for taking the time to allow Celeste and I to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to jump right into it. Uh, our flagship species at the Everglades Science Center is uh, a spoonbill, and I think you all know that. Um, and the reason we study spoonbills is not just because they're pretty or not because they're pretty, but because they tell us what's going on in the ecosystem. So if the spoonbills are doing well, then the ecosystem is doing well. This is the history of spoonbill nesting in Florida Bay. Uh, they were extirpated during the plume hunting era, and they came back to Florida Bay in 1935. And what you can see is that um, they kind of peaked out in the late 70s. In 1978, they had, um, Adrian, you keep taking my cursor, um, 1,250 nests in Florida Bay. But in the Northeast, they had 680. So more than half of the nests were in this Northeast section of Florida Bay. Um, and that's what I want to focus on is the Northeast section. So this is the, all the colonies in Florida Bay um, that we, we monitor. And the ones I'm going to focus on, there are some out here and we do have projects out here, but I'm not going to talk about those, but I'm going to focus on this group here. This is that Northeastern region. And these birds feed in this circled area around Taylor Slough and then up into Southern Biscayne Bay even. So this is their critical habitat for when they're nesting. Um, so what happened in the early 80s was that this canal system was enhanced. It went from 100 cubic feet per, per second capacity to 1,250. And the plan for widening that much was to actually add water to Everglades National Park on this side of the canal system and get it to Florida Bay. But what happened was this agricultural land kind of took over the project. And so the canal is kept lower to keep those farms dry. And in this pink circle, this is what happened. It's because the canal is lower than the Everglades, water actually flows this way into the canal system instead of towards um, Taylor Slough in Florida Bay. So this is what happened historically is the green arrows. And this was the major flow way to Florida Bay for fresh water. And it would kind of fill up this Northeastern basin and lower the salinity a great deal. And then that kind of acted as a buffer for the entire bay. Well, with the canal system, what happens now is the red arrows, the, the majority of water comes along US-1 into Florida Bay and bypasses Florida Bay. And so you, you just lost all the fresh water and Florida Bay gets very salty. Um, but to correct that, taxpayers spent $1 billion on the C-111 spreader canal project and it was simply designed to correct this problem. And it was completed in 2012. And my responsibility for the federal and state government is to collect the data to, to find out whether that project is working or not. So these are the locations in that foraging wetland that I, um, that we have sites at. And um, I just wanna focus on these and not so much out here. You see the C-111 canals right here. Um, what we do at these sites is we look at an ecosystem level structure. And this flow diagram just is, is that structure. Water management and rainfall dictate salinity and water levels in that wetland. Salinity, has an impact on the submerged aquatic vegetation. And both salinity and that vegetation have an impact on how many prey fish there are for spoonbills to eat. And the water levels also have an impact on how many fish there are, uh, but they also dictate the concentrations. So spoonbills nest when these fish become concentrated in the dry season, that determines nest production, and nest production um, dictates the number of rosy spoonbill nest. So, I'm going to walk through this step by step and just show you what we do and why we do it. This is um, our hydro stations and they don't look like much, but they're, they're really high tech. Um, and what they do is they, um, they're currently being upgraded to, to newer stuff. Our, our old stuff was outdated and was breaking. And we're also switching to 5G transmitters because they're 3G now and that's going offline. These uh, stations, take hourly recordings and we can download it about twice a week of salinity, water level, temperature, and at four of those stations, rainfall. And we've been doing this since 1989, so we have an extensive record. This is what look, things look like on a yearly basis. This is water level and this is, a, this is the grand mean, that's, that's the mean water level at this particular site. And then this cycle, this is based on the 30 years of data, is in June the water level goes above the mean 
and it goes way high and then it comes back down at December 1st, it crosses back over the mean and then stays below the mean until the following June. So our hydro year, a year, calendar year means nothing. The hydro year is June 1st to the end of May with a break in the wet season being December. So June to December is the, the wet season and then the dry season to the end of May. Um, salinity is inverted. So we have our highest salinities um, at the beginning of the dry season and then it lowers through to October and then gradually goes back up. Now this is a more marine site. It, this can be lowered or raised depending on where the site is in relation to fresh water. So if it's a more freshwater site, this will be down around zero for a good part of the year. <clears throat> now that impacts the submerged aquatic vegetation. And where we do this, our sampling for submerged aquatic vegetation is along these transects from freshwater to marine conditions. And the way we do it is with this quadrat. We, we jump in the water with the crocodiles and the sharks and um, we just count plants and wherever these, wherever this, there's a, a, a point here, we count the plant, the type of plant and the total coverage. And this gives us, we use a 20, that's a, a quarter of a square meter. Um, with that, we get percent cover of total SAV and by species. At each of those transect sites, we, we do 10 quadrats. And we do this every other month starting in July. And we've been doing that since 1996. So what happens with salinity and the SAV is, is, is what's shown here. As salinity starts going up and becomes more marine and hypersaline even, the plants die. They can't tolerate that quick change. Then the, the salinity drops back down, comes down to about zero, and we get plant growth. The salinity goes back up, it dies, and that's the relationship between uh, SAV and salinity. <clears throat> so now what's the relationship to fish is we at each of these sites is where we collect fish. And what we use is this nine meter square drop net that I invented to sample in, in mangrove habitat. You can see we can surround these little dwarf mangrove trees or it can be out in the open water. And the open water is where the spoonbills are gonna feed. Um, we, this cloth here keeps the toxicant that we put in to kill the fish so that we can count them. But that, that toxicant breaks down within a couple hours. We leave it up overnight just to make sure, but we, we don't have any by, by kill with this. So we use a nine meter square drop trap. It takes three days to collect one sample. That gives us the density and biomass and the species composition of the fish. Um, we, we look at abundance, that's how many fish there are in the whole wetland. And then it also gives us when they get concentrated. So that's stratified by habitat type, meaning, meaning fleets, flats, creek, and open water. And I'll show you what that means in just a second. Now the relationship between these fish and salinity that we demonstrated is that when you have a freshwater fish community, you have a lot more fish and a lot more biomass of fish. And as you add salt and you switch communities, that goes way down really fast. So the more, so the more saline the water, the less fish we get. Now this is the habitat itself. These are the nine meter square drop traps. This is the central creek where the spoonbills feed and these are called the flats. And these go dry every dry season or used to. And so that forces the fish into the creek and then they're concentrated for the spoonbills to come in and eat um, so they got enough food to feed their young. The water level during the wet season makes a great deal of difference. This is the 30 day depth prior to us collecting a sample. And then this is the abundance of fish along this axis. So the more water we have, the higher the water level, the longer the hydro period, the more fish we get. So you want high water during the dry season, but you want um, low water during the wet season. Right, we found that at right about 13 centimeters, the fish will leave the flats, that expansive area, and go into the creeks where they become concentrated. So that's about the time that spoonbills want to have their eggs hatch so that they have these fish concentrations. <coughs> Our method of, of looking at spoonbills themselves is all colonies within any nesting, any nesting record, even if it was 35 years ago and haven't nested since, we do that three times annually. Colonies that were active within the previous five to 10 years are surveyed on a 21 day cycle. When we find nests, we then go back to the colony every seven to 10 days. We mark a subset of the nests and then we monitor the progress of whether those chicks survive and how many of them survive to leave the nest. 
and that gives us our estimate of nest production. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is the chicks per nest, and this is the water level. Um, and this is every nesting cycle for 1988-2009. And what you see is, is you get really high number of chicks per nest, 2.4 on average, when the water level is really low. And as you get up here, you have years where every chick in the bay died, or every chick in the northeastern bay died. Um, and so that's zero production because the water level was too high. Um, this is that relationship looking at the fish themselves. Nest production again goes up over on this axis, and this is just the number of fish that are concentrated into those pockets. And as you get higher fish, you get more production. As you don't have any fish down at this end, then there's nothing for the spoonbills to eat and they fail. Um, the next thing we did is a banding and tracking study. We banded 3,000 nestlings from Tampa Bay, Florida Bay, and St. Augustine. And we also put satellite trackers on about 20 adults in Florida Bay. And we're repeating that study right now. We put 10 satellite transmitters out over the last couple months, and we'll do at least 10 more next year. This is what it looks like to band the chicks. We just take them out of the nest, we put these bands on them. And you can, most people send me pictures that you can still see the, what this number is. And that tells us how old and where the bird came from. And then this is the satellite um, transmitter. And this just tells us every hour where these birds are. So going back to this flow diagram, I've demonstrated each step of the way over till right here where we got nest production and number of spoonbills. Well, what we found with that study is that birds that are hatched in Florida Bay come back to Florida Bay when they're adults to nest. Same with Tampa Bay. There are some that disperse, but for the majority of them, they come back and in many cases, come back to the exact colony location that they were hatched. Um, and so if we don't have any production, we don't have any numbers in, in, in the bay. So this is um, the, uh, basically the history of nesting success in Florida Bay. The green lines are the ones where they produced at least one chick per nest or, or very close to it. The red are years that they failed and the X's are years we don't have any data for. Um, and so what we see is over this 23 year period, there were only seven successful years. And out of the data we have, that means about one third of the years they failed. And that was really important, but this is what it looks like now. So that's where the other slide let off. So since 2005, we've only had three failing years. Now the numbers are still really low, something's going on there, um, but what happened here? Well, a comprehensive Everglades uh, plan came, became law in 2000. 2005 is when the recover started, the restoration, coordination, and verification. And this is what provides field people the, the federal and state money to do their work and report back on a regular basis to the managers. And up until that point, that was largely ignored. So that was a change in policy. And then the spreader canal was activated in 2012. So let's evaluate that very quickly. Um, the, our results indicate that the project works very well in normal rainfall years, but at the extreme, it actually hurts the problem. Now, last year, the report that I just finished indicated that this possibly was corrected by increasing the pumps um, that pump into Everglades National Park. Now, our big problem with this is, is our annual reports are not timely. Um, we collect all the data, and then we start analyzing the data. So the, this comes out nine months after the hydro year ends. So when we give it to the policy team, we're talking as, as much as you know 20 months ago when something happened. So what we've done just, just in the last couple of weeks is we've developed the state of the SLU um, report. And it's updated quarterly, and it's not scientifically rigorous like our reports, but it's in more real time to show how water management is affecting Florida Bay. Um, and so just very simply, uh, this was sent out to you earlier today, is here's water level. The water levels were too high, it gets a red mark. It's really bad for spoonbills. The salinity did some good things and some bad things. So that gets a yellow because it's okay. There was practically no submerged aquatic vegetation in this past year. 
So that's very dangerous. And then we did get a couple of freshwater, a good percentage of freshwater fish, about 5%. Um, that's, that's good, but we want 40 to 50%. So that gets a yellow. And so things aren't doing very well right now for the spoonbills. And yes, we, it was a very bad year. We're, we're almost done with the nesting effort now. We only had 200 nests, one of the lowest years ever, and most of those nests failed. But the good thing about this is I can give this to Celeste um, and then she can use it to, to, to change policy and fix these things more in real time. We can use this for development. We can use it for communication. It's just a really nice thing. I urge you to take a quick look at this. Um, and with that, I'll pass it over to Celeste because this is where I'd hand it off to her. Well, thank you, Jerry. And while, um, while Adrian gets control back, or I don't know if Erica is going to control the, my part of the presentation, um, I'll just go ahead and just say that this, this really is a great tool. Um, well, that, I can control it. So Jerry, just unshare your screen, please. Okay. Um, so it, it's really valuable for us to have this type of tool because it's true, you know, I, before having the state of the slew, I would just basically call Jerry and ask him like, hey, what's the condition right, right now? Um, and try to use, you know, little tidbits of information. Oop, go back. Thank you. Little tidbits of information to try and, and really push forward and bring together our science with our policy because the two really go hand in hand. So, um, so I'm excited that we have something that's, that's in, in a more ready format, uh, ready share format uh, that the public and policymakers can, can peruse. Um, so I'm gonna be doing an overview of where we are with Everglades restoration. And I'll try to weave in some examples of how our science and policy work cross pollinate. So let me set this up for you a little bit. Um, so, Everglades restoration has been going on for quite some time now, and we are 20 years into the making of the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan. And that is really the 50-50 cost share uh, partnership that we have between the state of Florida and the federal government to rehydrate the Everglades. Um, and the starts and stops that we have suffered along the way are really the direct result of funding shortcomings. But 2020 was a banner year for Everglades restoration. What we were able to accomplish in terms of funding was monumental. The $316 million that we were able to get from the Florida legislature, coupled with the historic $286 million that we got from the federal government, uh, really marked a new era and a new speed to move restoration from planning to ribbon cutting. Next slide, please. So the stakes are high because it really is on us to ramp up the volume even more so that we can keep these projects on a timeline for speedy completion. And this is a brand new graph that just came out last week from the Army Corps of Engineers. And the take home message is that the longer that we take to restore the Everglades, the more that it's going to cost. If we invest more in the next six years, we will save time and money. And basically, we'll be able to implement Everglades restoration in the next decade, not in 20 years um, if the funding levels drop. And the 2020 budget numbers really set us up on the right track. In fact, the president's budget request for uh, fiscal year 2021 is 250 million for construction. So we're already 50 million above the historic 200 that were dedicated for construction of Everglades projects. So the stakes are high, but these bumps in funding really do yield results. Next slide. So let me tell you about some upcoming ribbon cuttings that we have, but before I do, I do wanna share a number of projects that we just finished building because despite what you may have heard, we actually have completed restoration projects in the Everglades very, very recently. Next. We have the Modified Waters Delivery Project that is the one mile bridge across Tamiami Trail, um, along with seepage infrastructure uh, to keep water in Everglades National Park. Next. Um, one more. Along with the C-111 uh, projects that Jerry just mentioned. 
as well as the Tanya Trail Next Steps uh, project that includes that second 2.6 mile bridge and some culverts along Tanya Trail. Next. And one more. And so all of these projects have been completed between the 2013 timeframe, but the vast majority of them were done in 2019. And so this is the very first time that we're crossing from construction, construction phase of restoration and crossing into the operational phase of restoration. So these are all projects that now have to come together via an operational plan to deliver the ecological benefits that were designed on paper. So we build it, now we have to figure out how to make them work. And really, Jerry's data has been absolutely critical in helping us um, combat some really bad alternatives that were coming out for this combined operations plan that it's uh, due to be uh, wrapping up in August of 2020 later this year. A year ago, the alternatives that we had to make these projects work together to send water south into the Everglades were really quite abysmal. Um, so we used Jerry's data, Audubon Science, to show what the current conditions were um, and contrast them with these really bad alternatives. We then in turn use our leverage, uh, our really strong relationship with the Water Management District Governing Board members um, and help them influence where these alternatives were. They actually abandoned that really bad alternative that they were spearheading. Um, and in turn, they've improved these alternatives a lot, um, a lot more than where we were. So we're in a much better place right now with this combined operations plan. Um, and we'll be sharing how the story ended, but this is one of the clear examples where, you know, that data that Jerry, that Jerry was talking about was used directly to implement changes in policy. Next, please. And the following projects that I'm going to be uh, sharing in this slide are projects that are going to be uh, completed within the next three to four years. Uh, like this one, like the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project is being constructed right now and is going to be done in 2023. This project will deliver more fresh water to Biscayne Bay. Next. We have the C44 Reservoir on the East Coast that's going to be done in 2021. That project is going to help with local basin runoff. Next. The C43 Reservoir on the West Coast, that's going to be wrapped up in 2023. That's the other reservoir that's going to help with local basin runoff in the Caloosahatchee side of things. And a really good story behind this project is that when it was first planned and authorized by Congress, it didn't have a water quality component. Uh, when Governor DeSantis came into office and he passed his executive um, action on 1920 to address water quality, he asked the district to um, put together a, a parallel project that will help address water quality and work in function with that reservoir. So that's happening right now. And that's, that's really, really good news because we're also trying to help with that effort. And next. We have the Bikini and Strand Restoration Project. That one is going to be completed in 2024. And Audubon played a key role here in telling the story of how this project was responding. Um, Audubon's uh, Western Everglades Research Center was actually conducting data to be able to tell how the ecosystem was responding to a change in hydrology. Uh, Dr. Sean Clam and uh, our research crew was there in Picayune looking at um, the populations of freshwater fish, frogs, and aquatic invertebrates, and they were very encouraged by the results. And I have a picture there that shows, um, that shows them in the field in a little bit. So um, Audubon is part of both of policy and um, science, and the two have uh, been helping us in, in making sure that these projects stay on track and deliver the results that we are seeking. And then the last one on this uh, set of uh, slides uh, is the Kissimmee River Restoration Project. Next, it's going to light up in the map. And this is really the best example uh, that restoration works. This is the poster child for Everglades restoration because the before and after images really tell the story that if we build these projects, the birds will come. And I'm gonna show you that through images. Um, please click next. One more. So here you have the Kissimmee River pre-restoration. It was straightened for ease of navigation and it basically turned the river into a highway for polluted water to come rushing straight into the Everglades. Next. 
Here you have the same area. You can see the straight, the fill back canal on the right hand side and the river starting to meander once again on the left hand side. Next. This is the same picture with the rehydrated floodplain. And next. The birds ended up coming back to this area way sooner than any anticipated and in much larger numbers than were targeted. Um, and this project, uh, we are expecting, we were expecting a celebration in October of 2020, but because of the current situation with COVID, uh, we are likely going to see that celebratory event take place closer to January of 2021. But once we're done with the last leg of construction in this project, uh, Kissimmee River would alone have restored 250,000 acres of wetlands and created an, an additional 100,000 acre feet of storage north of Lake Okeechobee via rehydrated marshes. Um, so this is a fantastic example of, yes, we build these projects and what happens, the birds come back, they use this area. Um, next slide. And because I mentioned Audubon's research work on Picayune, here is a flashback of our crew um, trucking along what uh, used to be a roadway and now is a restored wetland. Um, and once this project is finished in 2024, it's going to restore an additional 80,000 acres of wetland, plus another 80,000 acres in the vicinity of the Takahashi Strand, the 10,000 uh, islands, and the Rupi Bay habitats. So we talked about what projects are be, what projects have been finished? Projects are going to be done in the next two to th uh, three to four years. And um, now I really want to talk about projects that are going to be breaking ground in 2020. Next, because despite what's happening right now, and really due to the significant increase in funding that we received for construction. Uh, we are having projects that are going to be breaking ground in this year. In fact, next. We already broke ground in the EAA Reservoir um, SDA component in uh, late April. A couple of weeks ago, the Water Management District broke ground on the uh, man-made marsh component of the EAA Reservoir. And that was huge because, I don't know if you recall, but the previous governing board had uh, made a deal with the sugar industry that would have locked us out of this area until April 2021. And so the new governing board came in and they were able to expedite access to this area. And we have construction crews right now on this site a year ahead of schedule. And that is great news because every time that we can add more water cleansing capacity to the Everglades, that means that we can send more water south and prevent it from getting to the areas that are causing harm. Um, next. We also have uh, another component of the Central Everglades planning project. So that set of projects that are going to really help us remove barriers to sending water south and increase freshwater flow to the Everglades and uh, Florida Bay. We are gonna have a contract issued in uh, July 2020. So really, really soon. Um, I'm sorry, September 2020. And then we have two more contracts for the central part of the system slated to be uh, awarded in 2021 and 2022. Um, next. And one more. So we've talked about completed projects and projects that are going to be great breaking ground. Um, now I want to talk about a new wave of projects in the pipeline. How do we keep restoration going? Um, next. One more. So we have the Broward County Water Preserves Area project here in the map that really benefited from that bump in funding in 2020. It received $11 million to finish the design for this project, which means that it will be available to start construction in 2022. And this is a very important project because we can, because before we can turn on the infrastructure that SEP is going to bring, the Broward County Waters Preserve area has to be in place. So making sure that this project continues to move forward and is accelerated is critically important. And we're really happy to see that uh, fiscal year 20 funding cycles have helped these projects stay on track. And then the next set of projects that we have are all new projects being planned right now, some of which are slated to be uh, receiving 
congressional authorization in the Water Resources Development Act of uh, 2020. Um, and just a little bit of background, before uh, all SERP projects have to receive congressional authorization before they can get money to start, con to start building these projects. So it's a very important step for us to keep moving things forward. Next. And so one of those projects that's later to be authorized this year is the Loxahatchee River project. Um, and, and that is good news uh, that we have a project moving forward in WARDA 2020. Um, the rest of the projects that I'm gonna talk about have run into some uh, difficulties and, and Audubon has been playing a key role in making sure that not only are we authorizing projects, uh, but we're making sure that the projects that are authorized are going to be the best possible projects to get the most benefits for the ecosystem. Next. So we have the Western Everglades Restoration Project near Corkscrew by the Big Cypress Basin. Um, and this is really a clear example of how Audubon Science has played a key role in Everglades restoration. Um, and in fact, Dr. Sean Clam out of Corkscrew was conducting baseline data for uh, the Western Everglades project before we started planning it. Uh, funding was cut for that, uh, for that, uh, for that uh, baseline data collection and unfortunately it wasn't replaced. And so when this effort was started, uh, when we started planning this project, um, we run into complications uh, because there were some problems in quantifying the benefits for the area. Um, and there wasn't a lot of support for the alternatives that were on the table. And so right now, instead of having this project move forward into uh, word authorization, we are going to continue planning so that we can come together with a project that we all support, that we feel will deliver the results that are needed for that part of the ecosystem. Because we cannot comprehensively restore the Everglades if we don't have projects that will deliver the need that was identified by science in the first place. Um, next would be the Lake Okeechobee project. Yes. So the Lake Okeechobee Watershed Restoration Project um, is, another, uh, is another project that Audubon Science has identified as uh, falling short of the need in that part of the watershed. So thanks to Dr. Paul's Gray's unrivaled um, experience and knowledge in the Lake Okeechobee watershed, we are working right now to expand the scope of this project to make sure that we have more tools in the table to uh, have the best possible plan forward. So this one's another I'm, one that- I'm muted. Yes. This is another project that we're working towards improving okay. and making sure that we're delivering the right benefits for the ecosystem. And then the last project that I wanna talk about in this slide is um, the Biscayne Bay Southern Everglades Ecological Restoration Project. So please click next. And this one is a brand new effort. Um, and it's one that uh, it's supposed to be a regional approach to restoring both Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay. Um, and here's where uh, our science has also come through. We're not even started planning the project yet, and Jerry's already helping us understand in the policy side that the setup for this project is wrong that right now is slated to undermine uh, restoring Florida Bay. And so we're trying to actively correct that before we get started so that we can have the best possible path forward to have a comprehensive approach to restoring that southern part of the ecosystem. Next. And one more. So really, on where we go, because um, the policy science coordination for all of these new planning efforts that were in that previous map are going to be even more critical in the future than up to this point because we're getting to the part of the Everglades Comprehensive Restoration Plan that is really tricky. All of these projects are very difficult. And so our science policy coordination is going to have a lot more value moving forward. And so we're trying to integrate that aspect into our work and our communications even more. One more. Because at the end of the day, what do all of these little stars in the map represent? Why are we doing this? One more. This is why. Because this is what we stand to lose if we don't complete these projects. We know that our plan is solid. We know that the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan will work. Because if we build this project, we get the results. And how do we know that? Well, because we're Audubon. So the birds tell us, whether it's through spoonbills via Jerry's Everglades Science Center work, 
or wood storks through Dr. Sean Clem at uh, Corkscrew's Western Everglades Research Center. Corvia Paul Gray and the snail kites are telling the story in the Lake Okeechobee area. The birds are the measure and the treasure of the Everglades. So with that, I thank you for your time and I think uh, we wanna turn it over for some Q&A. Absolutely. So if anyone wants to uh, have a question, feel free to unmute yourself or I can unmute for you. You guys make a great team, by the way. Good job. Do. Yeah. Thank you so much. While people are, uh, are thinking of their questions, I will also just mention that uh, I think most of you realize that Celeste has been doing a seamless job of running our Everglades work remotely from Boston, where she relocated with her now husband more than a year ago. Um, thank you, Celeste, for, for your heroic work in making that distance situation work for all of us. And um, I am excited for her and sad for us to share that she will be going back to graduate school in the fall. So uh, she's agreed to continue in that distance capacity for us full time until school starts. And then we'll drop back to just a few hours a week that um, she'll be able to help us continue some of our organizing work that's going on with Laura Aguirre and now Hallie Goldstein on the west coast of Florida. So um, we've been lucky to have Celeste all this time and uh, I won't lie, I, I hope that there will be a day soon when they will leave the frigid north and return to us in Florida so that we can enjoy her talents again full time. So. Thank you, Julie. That's the hope for sure because it's, it's still cold right now. I'm wearing a sweater. <laughs> Which is criminal, criminal. It really is. What's the weather like, Jerry? What's the weather like in the Keys? It, well, it's, a, it's probably a good thing that, that we're not having a board meeting later this week because it is supposed to rain all week. Ah, there you go. That makes us feel a little better at least. It poured all day yesterday. The sun's finally coming out right now, this first time. And then it's supposed to go right back to pouring rain later in the week. I'm just disappointed because for, for the board members on the call, I had been talking with Jerry about staging an opportunity for folks to see that trap in action, that that square-sided fish trap that you know rolls up like a like a curtain and then with the click of a button, whoosh, drops with weighted nets to catch the fish. And honestly, it was all about me. It had nothing to do with what you guys were doing. <laughs> It's the thing I was looking forward to most with the uh, with the meeting at, at Ocean Reef, and now it's all for naught. So we'll do it again soon. So Ron has a question in the chat. He says his microphone isn't working, but Jerry, you mentioned that spoonbills often come back to the same colonies to nest. Is that repeated year after year? Or in other words, will you have multiple generations coming to breed in the same colonies? And if so, why are those colonies increasing each year? Well, the answer to that is, um, well, it's threefold. Yes, uh, there are multiple generations within a colony. Um, so our, one, our prime example is the oldest known spoonbill is one that my predecessor banded in 1988, just before I started. And we captured that bird in 2006, it was 17 years old, it just, just by sheer luck. He only banded a handful of them but it was at the exact same place where it was hatched. Um, so it came back to exactly the, the colony, the location within the colony. Um, now, other examples are in, in Tampa, we get a lot of returns there. We've seen um, it, at St. Augustine, we actually now have grandchildren. So we, have a, we know who the banded parent is. We know who the offspring is coming back to St. Augustine and now a third generation. So um, they, they do do this. But the funny thing is about the grandparent situation, the grandparent we banded at Alafaya Bank in Tampa. So Spoonbill started nesting at St. Augustine, I believe in 2010. So that's an example of a disperser. That's a bird that went someplace else and that's how they expand their range. And that's how they're moving north in the state and inland is some of the birds are just pre, kind of pre-programmed to, to go someplace else. Um, so it's very interesting, but the numbers, the, yeah, the numbers in Florida Bay are going down, um, whereas the numbers in, in St. Augustine are going up. They're, 
We started with uh, two nests in 2010. We now have 54. Um, I just talked to um, uh, Jan Anderson this morning, and she's trying to put sal or, um, tags on them so we can track them. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a real interesting bird. In about we estimate about five to ten percent of the dispersers. Everybody else pretty much comes back at least to Florida Bay if they're hatched in Florida Bay, to Tampa Bay if they're hatched in Florida Bay. But we got example after example after example of birds being recited at Tampa that were banded at Alafia Bank. So I hope that answers your question, Rob. He says, thanks. And then Celeste, Carol asks, what are the forecasts for the timing of the three future Everglades restoration projects? Yeah, that's a good question. So the brand new efforts that I mentioned, uh, they're in a series of different uh, places and I'm looking, I'm gonna show you. So I transcribed this horrible chart full of date lines and you know colors for you into those maps uh, because the, the thing with Everglades restoration that, is that we always have a project moving in three different phases. It could be planned, it could be being designed, constructed, and now the fourth phase is operational. Uh, the brand new uh, efforts that I mentioned towards the end of the presentation, we had uh, the Loxahatchee River project is slated to be authorized by WORDA 2020 in later this year. That's a process that's still ongoing. Um, and after that, it's just going to enter into the construction phase. But all of the other ones still have to go through a series of uh, planning steps. Uh, the Western Everglades project right now uh, is going to be continued in the planning mode for the next uh, year and a half, and then it's going to go to Congress for authorization in WORDA 2022. Um, the Lake Okeechobee project uh, is it's still uh, trying to make it to WORDA 2020, so it might be authorized or it might uh, be uh, entering into an extended planning phase, and that's what we're that what we're trying to accomplish to improve that project. Um, and then the Biscayne Bay uh, Southern Everglades project that I mentioned is going to start planning in July of this year. And that project's going to be in the planning mode for the next three years. Usually Everglades restoration projects uh, take about three years to, to, to plan so that you can come up with an actual uh, project to implement and construct. That's great. So um, not seeing any additional questions in the chat box. If folks have anything else they want to ask, now's your chance to type it in. You can also go ahead and unmute in case anyone's having a tech issue. Let me take a look. Mm -hmm. Lois, Kristen, Suzanne. All right. Anyone? Well, sounds like no questions means that you guys nailed it. So <laughs> thank you so much to both of you for such uh, information filled and concise presentations. I feel like I know I learned something. Hopefully everyone else did too. Um, this will be recorded and so we'll be sure to share the links with the other members of the board that weren't able to join us in real time and uh, I'm sure that we'll have other uses for this material from the development team too. So right. stay tuned. You guys are, uh, are no <laughs> doubt soon to be uh, video rock stars and start planning to, to sign autographs and the like. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. Uh, Thank you. All. Thanks. Yes. Have a wonderful yeah, afternoon, everybody. It's good to Thank talk to you. you. Thank Thanks you. To see everybody. Bye. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye.